Hello and welcome to On the Record, a debate style television talk show where Bahamians will find the balanced, true, and open debate they've been looking for. There is a profound old adage that says the youth of a nation are the trustees of prosperity. Some politicians look at their political careers as cradle to the grave jobs, never getting enough of them, subsequently blocking young bright minds from getting a seat at the table of governance. Besides all the issues and negatives cast on the young people, there are still some who have risen above the mire and are holding their own. Young men and young women are out there shining brightly in youth arms of political parties and service clubs all doing their part. Well, tonight we're going to talk to Tevin Bannister, a council representative of the Torchbearers Youth Association, that's a youth arm of the FNM, Barry Griffin, chairman of the Progressive Young Liberals, youth arm of the PLP. Our topic is Bright Minds, the next generation of political leaders. It's all on the record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We are back in just a moment. Is your loved one celebrating a birthday? Or maybe they're commemorating a special occasion and you don't know what to get them. Why not get them something custom made from Executive Printers? At Executive Printers, you can create personalized calendars, greeting cards, and even playing cards just for them. A one-of-a-kind gift. They can even do personalized cups, mugs, keychains, coasters, and notepads. So come in and place an order today. We are located on Jerome Avenue South or log on to epbahamas.com for more info. Wait, that's Oma a little from the wire. You think everyone is Oma from the wire? Wow, it's really nice to meet a fan. It's like he's right here. Are you telling me he's being all type shows and stuff? Hey, you know, Rev Go Play plays a lot of good movies and TV shows. Excuse me, can't you see we're watching something else? Rude. Rude. Settle all your pop culture disputes with Rev Go Play. Watch, record, and stream all your favorite shows wherever you are. Free for all Rev TV subscribers. Rev, you and us together. And welcome back to On the Record. We are speaking with youth leaders tonight. Persons of Tevin Bannister, he's the TYA Council Rep, and Barry Griffin, Chairman of the Progressive Young Liberals. Our topic is Bright Minds, the next generation of political leaders. Gentlemen, welcome to the show, Tevin. Welcome back. Barry, welcome. Good to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. You know, uh, the thing about this show, from the very beginning, we always wanted to ensure that we had a, a diverse group of, of guests. Um, and even though politicians traditionally are of an older generation. Um, it's, it was always very important to us to keep in touch with the younger, I'm gonna do it, Generation X, Y, uh, to, to sort of always keep that window into the future of politics. And you gentlemen certainly represent that. I wanna start out by a very fundamental question to both of you. How do you define leadership, or how do you, yeah, how do you define leadership in the context of today's Bahamas? I guess I'll, I'll begin. Um, good evening, Jerome. Good evening, Bahamas. Um, leadership to me, I think, is something that is so critical nowadays in the Bahamas. I think um, when we examine our country, and um, as we venture into our 45th year of independence, um, we see that 
you know, there's so much issues in our country today, um, especially plaguing the younger generation, um, gener our peers, um, the peers of Barry and myself. Um, there's so many issues that are facing our country today. And um, like you said, in the context of the Bahamas, I think now is um, high time that we um, recognize that we need leaders who can take our country into a 21st century direction. Um, we've been trying for a long time to get our country to that particular level, but I think um, we haven't quite met the mark per se. Um, so I think um, a leader is one who has the fortitude to make the tough decisions and to sort of reverse um, some of the, the, the um, poor choices that may have been made in the past. Okay, uh, good evening Bahamas and thank you again for having me on the show. Um, leadership, so that's a loaded topic and a, it's a loaded word, but um, my view of leadership, I would take it back to sort of an old Bible quote, you know, without vision the people shall perish. And so that's the first thing about leadership. I think any person who puts themselves forth as a leader, they need to have vision. Now I'm going to take a little bit of a bone of contention with something you said before that here in the Bahamas, when we think of politics and political figures, we think of an older generation. But I will hark back to the 1950s and the 1960s. It was a 26-year-old Sir Lyndon Pinlin who became leader of the PLP, and it was a 33-year-old Sir Lyndon Pinlin who became premier and led us into independence. And so when it comes to politics here in the Bahamas, I would disagree with you and say that in fact, we are used to young people taking up the mantle of leadership. And so bringing it to 2018, I would say Bahamians in general, and young Bahamians in particular, we are looking for those leaders that bring that vision, that speak to the needs and desires and anxieties and aspirations of the Bahamian people. So in terms of leadership, we've always wanted and desired leaders who have a bold vision for the future of our country. And so for me as a young person, that's where the buck starts and it stops. Leaders who have a vision and then leaders who can take that vision and move us forward. I'll tell you what, how my generation sees it. Mm -hmm. Sir Lyndon Pinling in the <clears throat> 70s would have selected a Perry Christie and a Hubert Ingram as young men who he thought at the time um, would be good men to succeed him and others in power. Up until last year, Perry Christie and many of his contemporaries still remain <coughs> in politics. As a 46-year-old man, that, gave, that gives me reason to pause. Because all of my life, I have seen the same men and sometimes women at the helm. In this instance, now in the current parliament, um, and, and that's sort of looking across the divide, there are new faces. And that's something I have never seen in my, it, it, when I say new faces, new faces mm -hmm. um, in terms of men who have not served, I think maybe with the exception of Brent Seminar, uh, who have not served more than two terms. And that to me is very disheartening because it took for me almost a lifetime to see that change happen. Mm -hmm. But having said that, are you concerned though that we are, <laughs> that, that they are, that we see enough of the younger politicians rising to the forefront and taking positions of authority. And I mean within, not just within government, but within the parties. Uh, Barry, I'll start with you. Reason I'm gonna start with you, the PLP uh, is an in, it's a political institution in, in many instances. Yes. And I know that you all are challenged with, in some instances, trying to move that old guard out and getting younger people, in, 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 people like yourself in position. Um, I'll answer not just from the point of, you know, being a young PLP, but from just being a young Bahamian. Right. I think there is a concern that there aren't enough young people at the forefront in politics. Um, but it reminds me of a quote, power doesn't concede anything. And so my personal view on that is that the onus is now on young people, in particular millennials in my generation, to now take up the mantle and begin to make our voices heard and fight for that spot at the table. Although the old guard has, I think, um, they should have a commitment to bring pe young people into the forefront. I think it's also up to us to make our voices heard and to sort of demand a seat at the table. And so when I was elected as chairman of the Young Liberals, one of the first things and one of the first speeches I said is that 
I do not expect anything to be given to the young people of the PLP. We must prove ourselves. And so while we are demanding that you make room for us, we're also here to show that we're ready to take that spot at the table. And so my call when I speak to young people around the country is that, look, I know many things are happening to our generation. We're seeing pretty much what we feel institutions around us are collapsing. Things that are supposed to be working, they're not working. And so we feel angry and we get apathetic and we sort of move on into our own little corners. But I try to make the argument that now is the time in particular that we need to show ourselves and show unity, um, not in our political colors, but unity as a generation to say, hey, these are the things we need, these are the things we desire, and we must begin to sort of fight that old guard collectively, again, not in our respective political colors, but as a generation. How do you rail against the, I have been in public service, or I have been in party service for 20 plus years, 30 years, I, boy, go sit down, <laughs> you just reach. I know how this thing runs, mm -hmm. I know how to win elections, I know how to run a party. How do you rail against that when Barry's talking about you want a seat at the table, but I am not prepared to move? Well, I've had the opportunity to serve on our party's council for quite some time. And of course, I've, I've seen that type of behavior um, you know, from persons who may have you know, ran in elections from the 80s and, and 90s mm -hmm. who, I mean, perhaps feel entitled to that. Um, but the question is, how do I rail against that? I think that you know, we are slowly beginning to see the shift of that uh, particular generation. And I think um, you know, the passing of, of uh, um, Madam Teresa Moxie Ingram that came as a shock to many individuals within the party and the Bahamas, I think that may have served as the um, sort of wake-up call to that older generation to let them know that you know, you, you, you've served um, your country well, you've served the party well, but you know, you can't fight against time. The younger generation has to come on the scene now and we must begin to take up the mantle and, and begin to contribute to society. Barry, what would have caused you to answer the call to politics? And I have to always ask this question because I, <laughs> sometimes I think people have to be crazy to enter into politics because it, is, it, is, it can be such a divisive, dangerous, dirty game. Um, and then when I see young people like yourselves entering, I think to my, I often, I often ask myself, what is the motivation? Wait, well, here's the thing. First and foremost, I, by no stretch of the imagination, consider myself to be a politician. Now, I will concede that I am, in fact, involved in, in, in politics now. That's a given. But I don't consider myself, by any stretch of the imagination, to be um, a politician. I'm a young man who simply wants to get involved in the national discourse in my country. But do you and have this aspirations? Is, this is one way. Do you have aspirations to, to, be, this, this one to be elected so. one day? So I'll just give a little bit of history. So it's been about two years since I've been back in the Bahamas from abroad studying and working. And so when I came back home, you know, like many young people, I came filled with idealism and sort of this energy, ready to give, ready to serve, we ready all did. to change the world, we all, we ready, all to, did. ready yeah, to change the Bahamas. In, yeah. And so. It was right around the sort of hyped up sort of political season. And so I got involved. I did some work for some candidates. I got involved on the legal team of the PLP. Um, I am an attorney by profession. And so I worked behind the scenes. But it actually wasn't until after the last election that I truly got involved. I sort of immersed myself in, into the young liberals. And an opportunity came for me to run for leadership. I ran. And in August of last year, I was elected as chairman of the Young Liberals. And really since then, it's been my focus to be in the communities and in constituencies all over the country. I have to ask you this, though. People. I have to ask you this. Had the, had the outcome of the election been different, would you have gotten involved? That's a good question. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that, but... Um, one of the reasons I am involved in the PLP is because of the outcome of the last elections, I saw an opening. I saw that there was a chance for young people to come into the organization and to move the organization forward. You know, the sweep took away many of our long-standing members of parliament, many of the people who've been running the PLP for a very long time. And so as a young person, I think young people all over the country see it as an opportunity that real change can be made. But going back to what I um, was saying, at this time, you know, working and meeting young people all over the country, that is now helping me to build the foundation of my political beliefs. You know, I'm learning that 
young people all over the all over the country, they all have an important story to tell. And I'm learning that there are many things that divide us, but when you actually talk to young people, no matter what constituency, no matter what they're doing, there's more that sort of bring us together. Common and problems. So, co common mm -hmm. problems, common dreams, common aspirations. And so for me, that is why I've gotten involved and why I continue to be involved, because I want to be one of the young people who are on the scene fighting to help make a pathway for more young people to Very quickly before I move on, do you ever see yourself becoming party leader? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, 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 no, that, that, that's a good question. Um, for me right now, I do not want to be pigeonholed into sort of any kind of, of role. I'm, I'm new to this game, I'm learning, and I'm open to the possibilities. Um, so. Very good answer. Very good answer. I wish more politicians would see it that way. Yeah, but at a time when, I mean, we would have said it earlier, when young people seem to even be apathetic to the political process, sometimes even apathetic to, to, to getting involved, as fundamental as voting, um, you would have heard some people in the last election say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm, I don't want to get involved. What is it that, 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 that is motivating young people like yourself to get involved, to become a part, when you look at the outcomes of, of some of the political careers mm -hmm. of some people. Um, some people have really crashed and burned at the end of their political careers, and I'm sure that must be a scary uh, thing sometimes when you, when you look at it. I mean, of course you would always discuss that possibility of, of crashing and burning at the end of one's political career, but what I've noticed during my time, and I, I joined the Torchbearers officially in, in 2007, so I've been knocking oh. about for for quite some time. You um, almost aged out it. <laughs> <laughs> Getting there. But you know, since, <laughs> since I've joined, I've had the opportunity to meet with, with scores of young persons, you know, from a wide cross section of the Bahamas, you know, whether it be from an inner city um, constituency or some of the constitu constituencies rather on the outskirts of New Providence or in the family island. And um, like Barry, um, you know, the, some of the experiences that they have shared with me, you know, is, is stories that that you can't make up, you know, so many Bahamians who come from varying backgrounds and each of them that I found all have something and have ideas that they want to contribute to society. So while they may not be um, willing to come and sit with you on, on the record and discuss these matters, you know, they all have ideas, they all have um, dreams and visions that they have for their country. So I think, you know, in the last election, I know apathy was, was sort of the, the, the motivating word during that entire process, but um, I think a lot of young Bahamians still have a dream for their country. They still um, understand that the Bahamas needs them, and I think that's the driving force for them. Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, because you've got just a few seconds before um, we go into the break, but in, in both of your estimations, do you think that young people really help to drive um, the change that we saw in, in, in the last election. Do you think that that, that young vote really helped to, to drive the change? Why is he shaking your head? Yeah, I would, I, I would say absolutely. I mean, that, and that, that's just not here in the Bahamas, all over the oh, world. Yeah. Um, these, these few last elections over the last few years, we see young people were the deciding factor. But here in particular, when we see the activity that was on social media in particular, we see that young people were driving the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so my view is that, you know, moving forward, young people are going to be an even greater part of our national discourse. Kevin? And I think both parties recognize that. Um, they sort of understood that the old tactics of campaigning, the old um, political um, ways of campaigning no longer resonated with the young persons. And like Barry said, social media was, was a huge factor. Um, this is where you, you have a lot of young persons who weren't willing to go to a rally, who weren't you know, mm -hmm. willing to participate in And still will not person. go. Yeah. Exactly, so we, 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 we understood that, both as PLPs and FNMs, and we put that, um, that information before them in social media. We reached out to them in their space. Um, so I think all, all parties have understood that you know, there's a change that has to take place because the young people are driving what's happening in our country today. Well, gentlemen, we are at the point of our first break in the show. When we come back, our discussions are going to get a little bit different. Uh, we've all been singing on uh, our one hymn sheet on one accord, but I think our next few segments are really going to show the differences in our guests. Stay with us. We are going to be back with more on the record right after this.
This segment is sponsored by Percy's Island Game. We're going to give you a check every week for a year. Percy's Pension Plan, Island Game. Bro, you hear about Percy's Pension Plan? Yeah, something about $1,000 a week for a year. That's Percy's Pension Plan. You could win one of five. All you gotta do is put $20 on your Island Game account and you have a chance to win up to 52 times. You know something guys? I can need one of those Percy's pension planning because with Island Game, it's surely a guarantee. I got no tension, I got, I got Percy's pension. Counting right this easy train at Percy's Island Game. Welcome back to more On The Record. We are discussing Bright Minds, the next generation of political leaders. My guests tonight, Tevin Bannister and Barry Griffin. Gentlemen, we seem to be in a slight political tizzy. Um, as the country gets used to the Minnes administration, just shy of a year in office, what exactly do you think of uh, the mode of operation of the Minnes administration thus far? David, I'm going to start with you. Um, well, I think we've been doing an excellent job thus far. Um, I guess there, there are some uh, stories out in the, 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 the public right now um, where persons would, would beg to say otherwise. but. Um, I think given the fact that we've been in office for 10 months, um, we should not judge a marathon simply by the first few meters of the race. Um, 10 months, we, we, we um, have had the opportunity now to get into government. Um, I have a lot of ministers who I've spoken to and, and work closely with from the council level have indicated their um, strategies for um, reforming and bringing greater efficiency to their government agencies or government ministries rather. Um, so I think um, time will tell as we continue to move forward in the upcoming months. Um, we will see more of our manifesto points and initiatives being brought to the fore. Okay, Barry, I'll give you an opportunity now. Here's my view. I think Bahamians largely, those who supported the PLP may not admit it, but Bahamians largely were hopeful that some change would have come about after the election. Um, almost a year in, I think that hope is weaning. I use the example of someone who's hired for a job. I think there's almost a probation period where, you know, you give them about three months to get comfortable, you settle into your position, you make your mistakes, but at some point you're expected to perform. Mm -hmm. We're well beyond that three month period. We're knocking on the door of a year. And I think Bahamians are concerned and a bit anxious and their, their anxiety is creeping up at the fact that it seems to be um, no change at all. In fact, there have been some key missteps, um, lots of misstatements that, that have happened that are getting young people in particular concerned and anxious. Um, so the mode of operation, I would say, shaky. Kevin, I, there are some things you cannot deny mm -hmm. um, that have gone wrong for government and they have played out so very publicly. Um, I, I, I noticed even, you know, from my own observations, hardcore FNM supporters are speaking out and loudly against some things that are happening within government. I'm sure that must be concerning um, to yourself and others within the party. Um, and that's understandable, but um, further to Barry's point, um, you know, I understand the point regarding probationary period and what have you, um, but we're dealing with a government here, um, we're dealing with an entire country. Um, these problems that we are facing today, um, they weren't, they, they did not come about on May 10th, 2017. Um, we've had three prime ministers before this current one, um, one who served 25 years in office, another 15, another 10. Um, so collectively that's 50 years um, um, of governance um, in this country. Um, so all of the problems that our country is facing today, of course we were giving, given a very significant mandate, um, you know, being elected um, 35 to 4, a very significant mandate by the people of the Bahamas to deal with these issues. But we have to realize that um, these things take time. Um, and I've seen no prime minister in the history of the Bahamas who was judged 
based on a 10-month period. I've never heard anyone say, well, let's, let's look at Salinden during but, his 10-month yeah, tranche. If, if, I, if office, I can for a moment, yeah. the people of the Bahamas did not elect the FNM to hear about what happened prior yeah. to coming to office. Understandable. People elected you based on what you said you were going to do in mm -hmm. the now. And the reality is we are living in the now. Mm -hmm. What happened under Christie Ingram pending administration is of no concern to the 20-year-old, to the 21-year-old, mm -hmm. Many, in many instances to the 46-year-old, myself <laughs> included, people are not interested in what you met. Mm -hmm. People elected you for the now. Well, of course, we are working assiduously to deal with the issues that the country is facing right now. Um, I think when you look in terms of the expansionary fiscal policies that the government is currently putting in place, and I think you will, will hear more of it, during our next budgetary cycle, um, you know the the projects that we are seeking to implement in the family islands, just see, and in New Providence, just seeking to bring about some sort of stimulus to our economy. Um, of course, like Barry said, you know the the excitement may be waning, but we realize now within the free national movement that the work um, has to be done. Um, we met a very tall task in place, um, like you said, and a very valid point. You, you, you do not wish to hear what happened in the past, but you know, I don't even have to go too far back. You know, if I just look at the previous five years in office, you know, there, there were a lot of things that were done, rank corruption within our government ministries and what have you. And you know, it's a lot of cleaning up that, that needed to be done. But I think if one was to examine our manifesto, um, you know, recently, you would see that we are working steadfastly on getting these things done, the things that we have promised the Bahamian people. And, you know, we have another four years in office. I think, you know, as we continue to go on, you will then be able to judge the free national movement, judge Dr. Minnis on his performance in office. Barry, I, I also watch with interest um, the response of, of the opposition, um, members of the opposition, some who are within Parliament, and by Parliament I mean House of Assembly and Senate. Senate. And, you know, as in <laughs> always the case, I always look at opposition and I ask myself, well, when you were in office, these problems existed, they still exist, but now that you're in opposition, they seem so grave. You know, there is a disparity. Because when some of these folks were in office or in a position, you know, and now you're criticizing a sitting government, you just came out of office less than a year ago. Well, I mean, that's just the nature of politics and that's the reality. The fact is, when the FNM was ushered into government on May 10th, they took on the problems of the Bahamas. The Bahamas has had successive administrations, and admittedly, I think Bahamians, we're all astute to the fact that Bahamians know many of these problems were brewing over the years. But when you take government, and you take up the mantle of government, you take on those problems. I don't think you're allowed to blame the people before you, because when you ran, you're essentially saying to the people, I have the answers. And so when they come to you for those answers, you're expected to produce. And so in speaking about the opposition, I think any strong opposition would hold the feet to the fire, um, would hold the fire to the feet of those in power. That's just the nature of the opposition. And the fact that the PLP only has four members in the House, four members in the Senate, I think that puts an even greater onus on the PLP to keep the government accountable. You know, um, the first, I would say, maybe three to four months into the Minnes administration, opposition was very quiet. Um, not a lot going on, and I'm sure there was a lot of regrouping. But it seems now that the party is now emboldened and empowered based upon a lot of things that are <coughs> happening um, and a lot of the outcries that are coming from the public. Do you see a momentum back towards the PLP even at this stage? I would say I do see a general momentum within the public in general. I think a Bahamian sort of, uh, uh, a famous sort of PLP and Bahamian quote is that, you know, the power rests with the people. And so the power of the PLP comes from the power of the people. And so we can be only be energized when the people are energized. And so I think we're all in, in these Facebook chats and these WhatsApp groups and we see the discussion that is happening. And I think it's clear to all Bahamians that, like I said before, Bahamians are concerned, can, Bahamians are anxious and people mm -hmm. are talking out. And so as the government continues to have key missteps and make mistakes, you're going to have people take another look at the PLP and say, hey, perhaps what I thought I voted for isn't there. Are you guys regrouping and ready to take on this challenge again? 
One of the um, mantles of the Minnesota administration has been this um, move to stamp out all forms of governmental corruption, even bringing legislation to Parliament to ensure that the country is looked at um, as being a little bit more upstanding. Do you think that uh, after decades of we as a people, and this is not uh, to cast any aspersion on any particular group, but we as a people are, are used to operating things under the table, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a fact a lot of times in the shadows. Do you think that as a country we are ready to address this type of change where we are going to have to expose some things and some people and change the way that, that we do this? You know, everybody wants change once we on the campaign. But once somebody's now in office and this change is about to happen, then everybody begins to step back and say, wait a minute, I don't know if this is, this is what I signed up for. Do you think we're ready for that? So again, these are one of the issues that I have to speak on as a young person, a young Bahamian in, gen in general, and as a millennial. Um, when it comes to transparency, I think the general consensus of people in my generation is that we've been ready for the change. And so I don't know if this is something, a divide of the generations, but we grow up, we've, we've grown up in a world that is transparent. Information is out there. So we expect the information to be there for us. And so speaking as a young person, we've been ready for the change. And I think- But your generation is not running government. You're yeah. not running the civil service. Yes. Those are, and, and while you wanting change is yes. one thing, those who have to make it happen, that's who I'm concerned about. Are they the ones who do you think are, are ready for it? Well, we, that, well uh, we have to agitate for them to make this change. And let me just point out one thing. I think worldwide, I think in 2018, the millennial generation will become the largest voting bloc. Mm -hmm. um, in 2016, I think it was, we became the largest um, population in the workforce. And so we are a large bloc and they're gonna have to start answering to us. So I say, it's for us to agitate for that change. Yeah, that point is, is taken. Um, but of course, like you said, we're not running the government as yet. Um, of course, the time is coming. Or the we, civil service. Yeah, the civil which service, is, which, is, which is, is a beast a greater problem. In, in itself. Yeah. And I think that is where we, as a government, have gotten a significant amount of pushback. Um, because as, as I alluded to previously, you know, there are several ministers who have indicated to me um, their willingness and, and, and um, their intention to bring so e efficiency to the civil service. And they, you know, I've, I've heard the cries of, of, of several government officials and they've told me um, just how much pushback and resistance they've been getting. So I think we've been operating in the Bahamas, like you said, we've been used to doing things in a certain way for, for far so long. Um, so now when we come into office now and we try to make amends to these sort of things, we, we see that we're getting negative pushback against these I, things. I'm just curious though, you know, people who offer themselves a public office and of course you're running for office and there's a possibility you may get a cabinet position. I'm curious as to whether these people ever spoke to anyone within the public service. Because how could you be get into office and say, oh, we're, we, we are uh, up against resistance. Seriously? Yeah. Did you expect for, for it to be differently? I, you know, I, I hear that, mm -hmm. but I, don't, I, I, I will not accept that. Mm -hmm. I've never sat in government, but I know if I were to, what to expect. So I can't see anybody in their right mind telling me that, oh, I came into government and I, I, I'm up against resistance and I want to change. But you should know that coming in, what you were going to expect. Uh, well, what you expect and what you intend to do, I think, you know, the, the delineation must be made there. Hmm. I've never sat in the chair of a cabinet minister. I've never held that post. I know and I expect that if I do so, there, there will be significant pushback. But that won't stop what I intend to do, and 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 that in itself um, won't make it make the process any smoother. Simply because I expected um, um, some sort of change or resistance. So I think you know, the, all governments and all prime ministers are well intentioned in what they want to do. Um, so if things are going a bit slower than 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 we would um, wish for them to go, um, you know, that's just a part of the process. But that won't stop us from continuing to to carry out the mandate that the Bahamian people elected us uh, to do. I hate to tell you this, but people being a part of the process is not what people are always interested in hearing. They want change. Mm -hmm. But by the other thing too, and you know, I would put this at the feet of the opposition, when changes are taking place within the civil service and people are removed for whatever reason, whether they're involved in a, nefarious activities or inefficiencies or whatever, and they're removed, it becomes a big public spectacle and it's, and it's labeled as uh, political victimization. When we all know that a lot of people who have been moved ought not to have been there in the first place, and some of them, let's be honest, should actually be jailed for some of the things that they were doing. But you see it labeled um, as, as political interference or political victimization, and there is a huge 
outcry within the press? Well, I think what you've said is you've put, you've lumped a, a whole bunch of things into sort of one group, and I think it warrants separating things. And so when it comes to political appointees, I do agree that the government of the day reserves the right to appoint whom they see fit. Thank to you. Certain Thank things. you very political much for saying that. I, or, I think that, 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 that needs to be clarified but early as well. What yeah. you have now, what you see now, are mass firings of just general civil servants. And so I think that's where the issue comes in. Um, I was speaking to a young guy at the University of the Bahamas the other day, and he is someone who supported the FNM. And one of his bones of contention is, every day you open up the newspaper, you see hundreds of Bahamians being fired. And he's very cognizant of this, because the reality is, these regular Bahamians who are being fired, who have no, polit perhaps you may have voted for the PLP or the FNM, but they have no real political involvement. These are people who are responsible for taking care of their families. We are in a dire economic situation. And so my view is that every single person that you fire is perhaps responsible for many other heads. Others. And so the government's job isn't just to worry about sort of the pure economics. We have to think about the social cost of what we're doing. And I think that's the issue that we're now facing, and that's the issue that the PLP is trying to bring to the forefront. Gentlemen, yeah. yeah. I, I just have to stick a pin there. We've just completed our first half of the yelling at me and my have to take a break. We've just completed the first half of our show. Um, I'm sure that you're enjoying it thus far. Bright Minds, the next generation of political leaders. My guests, by Griffin, uh, PYL chairman, and Tevin Bannister, TYA council rep. Stay with us. We've got lots more to address on the other side of the break. We are in our second season of On the Record, and we thank you, our viewing audience, for allowing us into your homes every Thursday at 8 p.m. We value your opinion, and we want you to be a part of our discussions. So make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram and comment on our exciting topics. Remember, it's all On the Record. Every day, people suffer from some sort of joint pain. To put on my socks, to bend over, to put on my knees, it was really pain. I don't have it anymore. If you've been living in pain and you're tired of trying products that just don't work, you are not alone. Today, 1.5 billion people worldwide are living in chronic pain. Don't let pain deny you the life you deserve. Join hundreds of thousands of Omega XL users that have chosen to fight inflammation and get rid of pain. Now they're living a pain-free life to the fullest thanks to Omega XL, the all-natural anti-inflammatory that has more available Omega-3s than regular fish oil. Get more benefits in a powerful gel capsule that is smaller, easier to swallow, and more convenient. Switch to Omega XL and experience results you can feel. Put an end to your pain with Omega XL. Visit your local pharmacy or health food stores and get your Omega XL today. Welcome to the second half of tonight's show. Our topic is Bright Minds, the next generation of political leaders. Our discussion continues with our guests, Tevin Bannister and Brad Griffin. Tevin, I know you had a, a point that you wanted to make as we were going to the break. Oh, yes, in the previous segment, um, you know, my colleague Barry would have alluded to opening the newspapers and, and always seeing signs of mass firings. And, but, you know, it, that, that brings me to a point in recent memory where, you know, the, the Honorable Kalis Rule spoke at length um, about our public sector, our civil service being, you know, less than skilled. Um, so what we have here, and this is a problem that hasn't just begun happening, is it's been happening over the years. Mm. We've had governments, years. we've had governments come into power, uh, overstaff um, these mi government ministries and departments, um, and you know we have in. And I've spent some time in my younger years. Not that old, but in my younger years, say younger years. <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing, years doing, doing some summer jobs, doing some summer jobs in government departments and ministries, and I can tell you, I've seen, I've seen some things. I've seen persons just sitting around doing absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. and um, I think, and and in in recent memory as well, I think there was some some layoffs at BAIC, and when I spoke to individuals close to that matter, I think it was envisaged that BAIC operate with a personnel or a complement of about ninety odd persons. 
when an audit of, of the personnel was done at that department, there were in excess of 300 workers um, staffed um, you know, at that government department. So my point is, and it, it stretches back to the points I, I was making um, um, in the earlier segments, there are tough decisions to be made if we want to actually um, bring about this change that we speak about. You know, how long do we continue to operate in an ineffective and an inefficient manner just to satisfy, um, you know, the wants and desires of, 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 of individuals For around us? in For many votes. instances, and, and both parties are guilty yes. of it, I'm sorry. I think that as a government, you know, any government that comes into power, we must look at ways to actually developing our economy um, in terms of medium and small size businesses and see if we can, we can depend on the government for everything. Glad you, know? you brought that up because that now segues into what I want to talk about next. One of the, one of the things that the FNM campaigned on and one of, the, one of the issues that they have been facing from day one is jump-starting the Grand Bahama economy. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, the announcement of this deal with Oban has pigeonholed, I think, the government in many ways um, because there is this huge outcry um, from so many different sectors about this deal, the fact that an EPA was not done, there was mm. all the controversy about the signing, about the individuals involved with the company, and it's just really, to me, snowballed mm -hmm. into this huge issue. Meanwhile, you know, Grand Bahama continues to suffer. So, you know, my question is, was, uh, do you, both of you, do you see it now as government feeling itself pressured uh, to make a quick decision and has now done something and gotten themselves involved in something um, that may not be in the best interest of the country? Or is it that you think that, you know, again, this is being driven by something or, or some groups who are hell-bent on not seeing the government succeed? Uh, I'll stop it back. Okay. Um, this reminds me of something Barack Obama would have once said, and I think I paraphrase him here. If you cannot trust the government to do the job for which it exists, which is to promote the welfare and protect the welfare of the people, then all else is lost. And so my thing is, we are in dire economic straits. And the, the reality is, we do need foreign direct investment. We do need to jumpstart our economy. But I think the job of the government in particular is to make sure that any investor who comes into this country, any investment that we as a country partake in, that these things are properly vetted and these are in fact for the benefit of the Bahamian people. And so while there might be pressure on this government and all governments to spur economic activity, I think it's on the onus of government to make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And what we're seeing here is perhaps in this instance that wasn't done. And so now after the fact you have um, pressure groups coming out to say, hey, we didn't do this. Hey, you didn't consult us. And so now the government is having to deal with that. And so the reality is, is that, you know, the Grand Bahama economy needs to be jump started. But we really need to, as a people, in terms of being more effective, being more efficient and being a government for the people, we really need to vet things that are happening in our country. How is this being viewed within the FNM, within the various groups of the FNM, when you see such a large uh, public outcry in certain quarters? Um, well, I think that the prime minister addressed it and um, I will be the first one to concede that you know some missteps were made um, in this matter but like you alluded to Jerome the economy of Grand Bahama is in dire straits I don't know if you've traveled there recently oh I know it very uh, very so, well yeah yes. so you can understand quite well what I'm saying and you know so much so that the people of Grand Bahama you know elected the FNM in you know, outstanding majority, five seats, mm -hmm. um, because they, you know, in my view, see or saw rather that the FNM could sort of be a beacon of hope to them. Um, the, the, the economy of Grand Bahama is doing poorly. We must do something to jumpstart it. And I think that, that pressure was on the prime minister um, to sort of get a deal in place that will jumpstart the Grand Bahamian economy. Now, of course, like I said, some missteps were taken, um, but you know, the government, the government sector is a very peculiar thing. I mean, you know, we have the Bahamas Investment Authority. We have the technocrats and the, the, the individuals responsible for the daily running of the government who, you know, should have ensured that certain things took place. Of course, Hubert Alexander Minnis is the prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. That's the job that he signed up for. So the buck will always start and stop with him. Exactly what transpired, in, um, you know, in the, the meet 
of this deal is a story for another day, I guess. But well, you know, we've conceded that we've made some mistakes. That's what I find yeah. so very curious. You know, you started by saying almost 45 years in independence. So the, the arms of, uh, or the institutions of government are not new. Mm -hmm. The people in government, this is in their first time at the rodeo. There mm -hmm. are groups in there who do this. This is what they are, this is what they are hired and paid to do. Yeah. And I am just so curious as to how we would have gotten to sign a heads of agreement when so many institutions, so many groups within government seem to have either not been aware, overlooked, jumped over. What, there are just so many unanswered questions as to how we got to this end game and so many things were left out of the discussion or so many loose ends still exist. Well, we, we are the government, um, you know, regardless of what happened behind the scenes, we would have to take responsibility for that. Um, so like I said, we've conceded that mis missteps have happened. But what I would want for persons to do, and I, I've seen consultation has started on the, on the process, you know, notwithstanding the fact about the EIA and what have you, um, I would want for individuals to analyze the, the content of the deal and let's um, have a national conversation as to whether this deal will be economically beneficial for the Bahamian people. Because you know, there's a common saying that the gambler may be bad, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the house isn't straight. You know, meaning you know, <laughs> the gaming house is just loved you for that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one, one of the individuals at the time who was involved with the deal, you know, he had some 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 issues surrounding him, some fraud securities with, with you know SEC, and completely separate and apart from from this oil refinery deal and what have you. Um, so while the man may not have been worthy, we we cannot um, flippantly disregard regard the deal itself. Um, so I would want the national conversation to move sort of in that direction. Well, a, a couple of things. I, I, I'm happy that, that you and, and others have, have admitted missteps. And I think that that's very important um, in an instance like this. You must always acknowledge where wrong is. My only caution is that people are not always, people are not going to continue to accept that of course. going forward. Of you course. know, like, like I've always said, the honeymoon has been over. Yes. Um, but Barry, I know, I know you, you wanted to get in as well because I, I think you did make a point too that you know, um, and I would have liked to have seen, I'm sure many other people would have liked to have seen this public consultation before we signed off on anything. Yes. Um, but my, I'll say this, that one of the criticisms of the Christie administration was that there were all these consultations um, and kept going back to the public and asking opinions on different things, but the government still um, went and took, you know, its own line and its own course, despite what people were saying in some instances. Yep. So uh, again, and that's one of the peculiar things about government, at the end of the day, a decision has to be made. And as Tevin would have said, the buck stops with the prime minister. So I believe in each case, the prime ministers make decisions that they feel comfortable with and that they feel that they can back. In this particular instance, like I said, um, perhaps the I's weren't dotted, the T's weren't crossed. And I think it's up to young people, and I'm glad to see Tevin sort of taking on the mantle and saying, you know, there were missteps and the FNM needs to sort of um, take ownership of that. Because one of the things that um, I would like to see is young people were very active during this last election. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's safe to say that young people as a whole abandoned the PLP and went with the FNM. So my view is that this same fervor that we had during the election, we must use to keep the, um, to keep it on this present government. We must be the ones as a generation, as a block, advocating for the transparency that was um, campaigned on, advocating for the, the efficiency and the effectiveness that was campaigned on. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to see him taking ownership. I have that. to ask you this question as we go into the break. You mentioned it, that young people uh, had abandoned the PLP in the last election. As a party, have you all examined and gotten to the root causes as to why that happened? And are you addressing that as a party? You know, because let's be honest, we're almost at one year out um, and four years ain't that far away. Yeah. <laughs> and it can't be that you come to me four years later and say, oh, well, we're new and, you know, come look at me now. I mean, the fact that I'm sitting here today is a testament to the fact but that I the mean, PLP parties of, is considering they, the They've always had these youth arms. Yes. You know, and, and they've all had young people involved at some level. But, but my, my, my true question is, you know, are you and others like you at the real heart of the decision making now within the PLP? So let me tell you this. In October, I was excited to see a very energetic and energized PLP at our convention. And what I was more excited to see is that young people came out in droves at the PLP convention. So what that told me is, is that while we may have lost the battle, the war is still out there to be won. And there are young people who are still attracted to the philosophy and the core of the PLP. Now, 
addressing the fact of if young people are sitting at the decision-making um, sort of apparatus at the PLP? I would say absolutely yes. Um, the new leader has made it part of his mandate to ensure that young people are now on every board and every committee within the PLP. I personally sit on the leadership council of the PLP and many other committees and boards on the PLP. Many of my comrades in the progressive young liberals sit on these various boards. And so the current leadership of the party is ensuring that we are at the decision making table and that our voices are heard. Excellent. Gentlemen, um, we are at the point of our final break. Uh, we've got one more segment. Stay with us. Our discussions continue right after this. Gonna give you a check every week for a year. Bro, you hear about Percy's pension plan? Yeah, something about a thousand dollars a week for a year. That's Percy's pension plan. You could win one of five. All you gotta do is put twenty dollars on your Island Game account, and you have a chance to win up to fifty-two times. You know something, guys? I can need one of those Percy's pension plan, in because with Island Game, it's surely a guarantee. Boy, I ain't got no tension, I got Percy's pension. This is uh, our final segment. Welcome back to uh, On the Record. Tonight we are discussing Bright Minds, the next generation of political leaders with our guests, Tevin Bannister and Barry Griffin. Gentlemen, um, I think up to this point we've really you know, done a great job of putting things into, into perspective into the now, but I do want to look um, into the future now as that is what you represent. Um, first of all, I want to talk about what do you think are some of the greatest political challenges we have in the Bahamas today? What are some of the things that are plaguing our political system which may be preventing or hindering um, our, our movement and our growth um, from being where it ought to be? Um, for me, our biggest challenge would be the economy. Um, I think our government needs to sort out what is happening with the economy. We need growth. Um, as I meet young people, as I go through all these various constituencies, the one thing they talk about, jobs, training, opportunities, and that's one of the common themes that you see. Whether you are a young professional and you're talking about moving forward and having there be opportunities for Bahamians, or whether you're a low-skilled worker and simply look, looking for seasonal or temporary work, the, the fact of the matter is we need to get our young people working. One of the worst things that can, that can happen would be to have a generation of young people who've never held steady jobs. Um, because those things sort of teach responsibility mm -hmm. and they lend into other societal issues. So the thing is, we need to get our young people working. We need to have them on jobs. But is that just something for, <clears throat> for a government to tackle? Um, or, or does the, the, the private sector also need to become a little bit more involved in growing the economy? Well, I think the private sector is involved and the private sector has always been involved. I mean, the private sector is there for commercial enterprise, it's there for profit, <coughs> and so it's in their best in interest to keep it moving. But the fact of the matter is, you need a government that creates an environment where the private sector can flourish. And that's and very so key. Yes. There it comes in terms of regulations or deregulation, the vision that I was speaking about, having right. a vision of you know which areas of the economy we're gonna focus on, how we're gonna tackle it. Um, and so I think the private sector is involved and has been involved, but at the end of the day, the government sort of sets the playing field. And, and hopefully get away from this notion that um, government has to hire you and government has to employ you because culturally we have people that, that, that all they are interested in is getting they tell you, a government job. But mm -hmm. listen, I would say that our generation is the generation that is going to sort of remove itself from that. Yes, when you look at hopefully. young people, young Bahamians are the most entrepreneurial, enterprising and astute people that I've ever met. 
meet young people, like I say, no matter what constituency you're in, mm -hmm. everybody has what I would call a hustle. Yeah, Whether they're that's on true. their permanent job and they have a side hustle, mm -hmm. or what, um, I, I know entrepreneurship is a big thing right now. I know people who graduated from high school who've never worked for anyone. Exactly. Just because they've been doing their own thing. Listen, um, young people have seen institutions of government fail us our entire yeah. lives. Yeah. And so our generation in particular, we're very skeptical about government and these large institutions institutions. Young people are entrepreneurial. I think a lot of young Bohemians, they're very interested in starting their own business and working for themselves. Mm -hmm. Don't be like me and wait till you get over 40 <laughs> to decide to do something like that. Devin, I want to go back to our original question. What do you see though as, as one of the biggest hindrances um, in this country today from a political perspective? Um, well, like Barry, um, and I think we're blessed to have had the opportunity to to both study and work abroad and you know, gain a wider perspective on the way that countries, you know, larger economies are run. And I think from a political perspective, um, as a government, we must continue to do more to attract or reattract, if I could use that term, students who have gone off um, to study and work and bring that um, technical skill and those knowledgeable persons home and begin to contribute to our economy. Um, but of course, um, we must continue to do more as a government to ensure that this is a country or an economy that they want to come home to. Um, because um, far too often, I think, we fall into the trap where we just allow anything to go. Like I mentioned, the pushback that we have when we try to change um, you know, our government um, um, service, our public service, rather. Um, you know, we must create that type of country that attracts the young professional back home. Um, they go off, they see countries, they see economies that are, that are um, you know, on the technological um, peak of, mm -hmm. of, of, of those um, nations. Um, they see, they see uh, uh, you know, government sectors that are efficient, um, that simple, as <laughs> simple as public transportation when mm -hmm. I was, was, was living abroad. You know, it, it's something that you compare to the Bahamas and you're just like, wow, something as simple as that. But I think you know we must continue to advance our country technologically. Um, but I think we're 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 um, getting there slowly but surely. I, I had occasion to to form a company the other day, and I must drop a plug if you'll permit me to the to the registrar generals. Just leave a check <laughs> at the front desk. <laughs> There's a the government government um, um, agency, the registrar generals department, and you know it was just amazing. And I, I think that needs to be applied to every government agency. You know we were able to to form the company online. We did not have to. Stay step foot into one government office at all. So I must give kudos to the individuals down there who are responsible for the e-government services. Mm -hmm. But I think something as simple as that, we must continue to spread around the Bahamas, around our government sector, and attract young Bahamians back home to contribute to our country. One of the things um, that has, has really played out in recent months, the, the turbulence within you know this, government's, this government, you've looked at, um, for instance, the I don't know if I want to categorize this as turbulent, but the, the, the corruption charges that have been levied against um, former ministers of government, the Oban deal, this uh, firing just recently of, of reshipment from antiquities and monuments and his possible suit against the prime minister. These things have played out um, so publicly. Um, they have gotten so much attention. And being a journalist now of over 20 plus years, it gives me reason to pause someday, and I, and I smile at it because there was a time when things like this would happen. Um, they would be carried for a day or so in, in, the, you know, in the standard papers or the news, et cetera, and then they would be done. But there is so much of what is happening that is now being played out in the public arena. Um, and I think, you know, despite what your view is on the government, I see it as a very positive thing for the country because no longer um, are these things happening behind closed doors. Um, you have a sitting MP who held a press conference to say, you know, <clears throat> to, to publicly speak about his discourse with the Prime Minister. That was something that was unheard of. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, under, uh, I think under, under a Pinling, uh, under an Ingram, I mean, that would not have happened. Um, I think that's a testament to show that, you know, we're living in a different world mm -hmm. um, with the technological advancement, with the advent of social media. I think the public 
um, has a desire, has a need, and requires more information from, from our government. And so when you have the 24-hour news cycle, when you have the constant messaging in the WhatsApp groups, the face Facebook chat, people expect information. Um, and so these things are going to be played more publicly, I believe, as, as time moves on. And I agree with you. I think that's good for the country. Uh, you see uh, 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 Frederick McElpine will get up and, and speak out uh, against, you know, a government initiative in the House or what's happening. And you know, how Rhys Chipman, who's speaking on possibly suing the Prime Minister, which is a sitting party. On one side, you look at that and you say, you know, is this party unraveling or is this government mm -hmm. unraveling? But then you have to also ask yourself, is this a healthy thing for democracy? Um, I think... Well, on both sides of that coin, it is indeed healthy for our democracy. Um, but just to, unless we allow that point to go yeah, unanswered, sure. of course, the, the, I, don't, I don't think it, it, it speaks to the party unraveling. Um, of course, in, in, in um, uh, um, Frederick McElpine's case, you know, I think he represents a cross, a cross section of the Bahamas in, in Grand Bahama that, as we've already mentioned and discussed, is. Um, hurting significantly, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure any member of parliament in issues um, perhaps would, uh, you know, voice, and he, he should be, as he is the elected member of parliament, he should be the conduit or the platform by which their concerns are raised in the House of Assembly. So that, that is indeed healthy for democracy. Um, in terms of uh, Mr. Chipman, um, you know, in his case, I, I think these are appointed positions, of course, and I think Barry made the point in the previous um, segment, the Prime Minister can appoint whomever he wishes to, and we have to realize, I, I, don't, I don't think a lot of Bahamians do realize that when you are appointed, you serve at the pleasure of the Prime Minister. Um, so whether you were dismissed for something major, or whether you were dismissed for something minor, and sometimes I have to ask myself the question, who really is the Prime Minister? Because I don't know, I, is it Reese or is it Dr. Hubert Minnis? Because I don't know of one individual who can walk into their boss's office and say, okay, you're firing me, these are the terms under which I want to be fired. You know, so I think we have to realize that another show. He, he serves, <laughs> he, he, you know, the, yeah. they, those appointed individuals, and they're not um, public servants, um, you know, you serve at the, at the pleasure of the prime minister, um, you know, and as the prime minister already mentioned, I know there were calls to say why he did what he did or tell us, you know, the details of the firing. I think the prime minister would have addressed this matter um, when he said that, you know, Mr. Chipman's views and ideals did not line up so much with, with Dr. Minnis's and the FNMs at this time. Mm -hmm. So I would say, one, I agree, it is healthy for democracy. Two, does it speak to the unraveling of the government? As a member of the FNM, I'll allow Tevin to address that point. But I will say what it does speak to is, again, the concern and the anxiousness that I think the public now has. We've elected people to do a particular job. What the Bahamian people are now seeing these as sideshows that are distracting yeah, from doing the business yeah. of the people. And so when you have a government constantly embroiled in these sideshows and these missteps and these misstatements and these things that they have to come back and correct and um, sort of you know do public relations for, the, you beg the question, when are they finding time to do the actual work that they were elected for? So again, he can speak to the internal um, sort of issues in, in the party, but what I will speak for is the concern that the Bahamian people have of the way in which the government is now operating. I think that's a very important word, um, distraction. Um, you know, while it may be unfortunate that a lot of these things are happening, I think we cannot take away from the fact that the government is making um, strides into making our Bahamas a, a better place. You know, the, you know we've heard you know, tourism numbers are, are, are up substantially, um, crime numbers are down, um, you know, there are businesses that are beginning to see, you know, improvements in their bottom line. So while these things are indeed occurring, you know, much to the chagrin of, 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 of the ministers or the prime minister, you know, it, it simply serves as a distraction, like Barry said. But there are other things that are taking place. And, you know, I have to mm -hmm. encourage journalists, I have to encourage the Bahamian people at large to delve a bit deeper into what is actually going on. I, I would, uh, gentlemen, and we're out of time, but I would encourage the government as well to <laughs> tout yeah. what they are doing. We could do and a not, better job at that. And, and not get so embroiled and caught off guard with these sideshows and distractions. Well, Jerome, the one-year mark is coming up. Yes. And I think the onus is on the government at that one-year mark to show we've been in the office for one year and this is what we've done. I well, think the Bahamian people will be expecting that. I, I, I hope so. And I, I'm just going to throw it out there. We have put out an invitation for the Prime Minister to come and be a guest on the show to talk about 
is first year in office. We haven't gotten a response. Mr. Prime Minister, if you are listening and watching, could you please answer our request? <laughs> that's, my, that's my final note. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I, you. I have to tell you, this has been a, a fantastic show. I, I always enjoy uh, having young people. Not that I think that I'm too far out of the realm of a young person. But <laughs> I always enjoy getting the views um, and opinions. And I, I have to commend both of you. Oftentimes, um, representatives of the political parties disagree just for the point of disagreeing but you know it's always encouraging when we can come together and have discussions and agree on some points even though you may come from different sides so i appreciate that and i thank you and hopefully you know uh, those who are in politics who are watching will even though they are older may uh, take from your examples and, and understand that you know even though that we are we are different we can still agree but we can also agree to disagree so again, thank you very much. All thank the best you. to you. Thank you Hopefully one day I'll be sitting now with one or both of you as your party leader or some <laughs> cabinet minister. Who knows if, if, if the show is still around. Thank you so very much. We certainly hope that you've enjoyed our show tonight. Special thanks to my guests, Evan Bannister and Barry Griffin, my producer, technical staff, and of course you, our audience, for watching. Be sure and join us for more On the Record next week. Same time, same place. And in case nobody has told you, um, happy Easter.